What's cracking, guys? Omar Esau here, back with another video. Back today with a special guest. The uh, so it'd be the second year, right? The River City Royal Rumble bodybuilding champion, Eric Helms. I just want to thank uh, my mother, mm -hmm. God, yep. my team, uh huh, uh, and I'd say God, my mother, and my team. Okay, well. yeah. So just repeat that times two. And now that you're a bodybuilding champion, you have authority, never mind your PhD, it doesn't matter that you have your master's in nutrition, we, we're, we're okay about that. But you got the goods, you have the physique, and today I wanna talk about something we were discussing while training at Untamed Strength, shout out mm -hmm. to Alone uh, Thrall, and that is you will in a little bit actually be taking over my programming, and uh, one of my goals, as you know, is overall hypertrophy. But something you were remarking, you've done how many powerlifting meets? I've done 17. Yeah, you've done 17 powerlifting meets. You love powerlifting, you love strength training, uh, but where you identify a little bit more as, even though you've done fewer competitions, is a bodybuilder. Yes, Yeah. primarily just because I am above average as a bodybuilder, Yeah. and as a powerlifter, I enjoy coffee. <laughs> I am a great spectator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, we started discussing, and it's something I've said before, but when you're the River City Royal Rumble champion, it holds a lot more clout. We need um, the word classic in there. So we classic. Actually like, so the River City the Royal Rumble classic. classic. Just so that yeah. we actually give Alfredo and Giselle the hey, name. That's, I'll look uh, at the description. Yeah. And uh, uh, what do you call it? It's the second year too, but so classic. I love yep. it. Third year. It's, it's actually a really well-ran show, yeah. and it can grow a lot. So uh, if you're in the Northern California area or you want to travel, check it out in 2020. <laughs> I had fun, and uh, you were saying that the goal being hypertrophy, mm -hmm. uh, recently actually, and you can notice in your quad development, your legs have grown, yet the total amount of weight you've been lifting is less. Because once again, yeah. you've done powerlifting style training, your primary goal is hypertrophy. Can you explain then some of the mechanisms for someone that is not a beginner, yep. not an intermediate lifter, that is able to get greater hypertrophy from lifting less weights? I can definitely explain it. I think first I want to give a little bit of background yeah. in that I've got a lot of years of lifting under my belt. I started in 2004. Like I said, I've done 17 meets. Um, I'm also unfortunately six foot and don't have the, the greatest choice of parents. Sorry, mom and dad. Uh, which meant that my hips have not always agreed with my weightlifting and powerlifting decisions and the volume I've done. So in 2017, in February, I did get bilateral FAI surgery. That's femoral acetabular impingement. Very simply, when I went into deep flexion, especially under load, my femur would contact the acetabulum around the ring of your acetabulum, which is your hip. You have a labrum, which is kind of like just like a gasket socket protective layer. Um, damaged the labrum, and I did require surgery, and they also reshaped my femur so I could get into deep flexion, and now I have all that range of motion back. Yep. So after I spent that time, energy, money, and period of time recovering, uh, and just knowing that how much I don't want to go through surgery again, and uh, it was a really good decision because I, we found out when looking in there, if I had not gotten surgery, we'd probably be looking at some issues in my 50s. Yep. Uh, maybe total hip replacement very early. Yep. So it was a great decision, but I also am simply not willing to, to sacrifice the potential joint integrity. So I'm not getting back in a low bar squat. I am high bar squatting sometimes, but most of the time I'm doing front squats, hack squats, leg press, uh, and other variations, things like leg extensions, BFR training to hit my legs. Now the difference between doing the most load you can do, heavy low bar squats, and in training I have squatted 495 low bar, and I think in my best squat in competition is 222 and a half. Um, so I built my squat up reasonably high, um, you know, not, nothing crazy, but certainly for my body type, a heavy load. The difference between say doing uh, hack squats for, for multiple reps to, to, to failure and really getting your positioning down and everything and doing say a heavy set of five on low bar squats is one, well, actually, both really do load your quads quite well, but one loads your body yeah. a lot. Right. Um, so being able to do something like a front squat where the load is shifted forward, but you can get more knee travel and more tension across the, the, the musculature or the quadriceps because of the range of motion differences or the emphasis of where the load is or something like a hack squat. Um, 
it, it essentially you're thinking of all right yes these basic barbell movements are kind of the foundation of strength and kind of the overarching theme of strength training but there may be a point where the trade-off between loading your joints loading your body overall and the biomechanical position you may have to force yourself into and I do use the word force for some body types or some contraindications of injury like I had is not worth the benefit you might get right so what is the the, the, basically the fatigue to stimulus ratio, to give a shout out to kind of the Mike Isratel way of looking at it, for certain movements. And if your principal goal is hypertrophy, and then you think, okay, well I do need to progressively overload, uh, my volume should be manipulated in some way, I need to ensure that I'm seeing progress. Uh, you want to be able to build that volume, to build that load, to build that stress on the back of movements that aren't putting a ton of stress on your whole body. Yeah. So you don't have a weakest link, right? so that you can really uh, stimulate your quads. So for example, I'm able to do a handful of movements now, multiple times per week, for high reps, close to failure. And I know what happened when I did that with clean and jerks, snatches, low bar squats, front squats, and high bar squats all in the same mesocycle. Yeah. Within two years I needed <laughs> surgery. Right. So, but now what has happened is that my legs have looked the best they ever have. Right. And the amount of development I had on stage um, I mean, my legs have always been a strong po point. I've kind of been known for my hamstrings and my glutes, uh, but my quadriceps now, I would say, are, are on par. Right. And um, it's, it's been really cool to see because I didn't know I could make that kind of visual change at this stage of my career, but I really do attribute it to what I learned from uh, going through hip surgery yeah. and just having to be more creative now that my body wasn't cooperating. Now, let me ask you then a practical question compared to before, can you contrast how you used to train prior to that surgery when your focus was a little bit more strength oriented, so putting mm -hmm. more weight on the bar being the primary focus versus now where you're using a few select movements where you feel a great stimulus, where you're not, as you said, taxing the body as much, but you're stimulating the muscles more. Uh, can you just contrast your previous training to what you do now for those interested? Maybe they think to themselves, you know what, yeah man, I've done low bar squats, uh, I've done all this stuff, shit's achy, my back hurts, maybe I wanna change up, maybe I wanna go on a mesocycle more towards hypertrophy, how, how do we set it up? Right, so I'd say my, my training has evolved a little bit. Uh, we've talked about this on, on, on your channel before. It, I started with very traditional kind of your five by five uh, or, or, or variations on that theme. More sets of moderate reps, kind of your standard power builder approach because we know that that's just as effective as hypertrophy but it takes longer, the total stress is a little higher. But that's a trade-off you're willing to accept if your goals are strength and hypertrophy. Yep. Which while mine are, right now I'm definitely in a phase of training where the goal is more hypertrophy. So there's kind of a continuum. You can definitely take the approach of going, I'm gonna build strength and size together. I know it's gonna take more time. There's gonna be more overall stress, more potentially stress on my joints. But if you get to a point where that's not working for any of the various reasons we've talked about, the next intermediary shift would be having a little more contrast in your training. So you'll work up to like a heavy single on a low bar squat, and then maybe you do your back off work on a hack squat or a front squat, et cetera. So you build the skill, and then you find something that you can really load a lot of volume into without stressing your joints, right. you will work there. And then the final step would be, if you're like very much focused, let's say you're in the off season for a bodybuilding competition season like myself, would be to do the minimal amount of that first thing if you still care about strength. So for example, every other mesocycle, maybe I work up to a heavy single on deadlift, or I do some, some, some heavy, heavy work on, on a back squat, but I'd say maybe one third, one third to two thirds of the time, I don't even have a deadlift from the floor or a back squat on my program. Yeah. I might have a uh, front squat or safety bar squat, sure. and I might have RDL or good morning, yeah. but I'm not actually touching uh, those, those core compound lower body lifts. And instead, I'm doing something like uh, five by six on safety bar squats on one day, three by eight on leg press, three by 10 on a hack squat, and then a day where I do three by 12 to 15 on leg extensions. Yep. And I simply in intersperse them uh, on different days based on where the recovery is, where I take an off day, et cetera, and then work on either adding reps slowly or maybe even a linear progression from like eight, seven, six reps with adding load. So having some kind of thoughtful progression and then spreading that volume out allows me to get more total work done for the quads. So you're saying there's a chance. There is. There is. Absolutely. Where uh, I think uh, sometimes, and I've put out a lot of strength content on this channel, 
that some people will identify themselves as a particular type of person. Well, I'm a power from a this, I'm a that. And from working with you, from uh, doing now that podcast, Iron Culture, mm. and just seeing the different possibilities, but also taking a look at uh, some of the research or how you can organize your uh, training where there's more than one way to approach it. Yep. And if your goal is to maximize hypertrophy, and maybe you're like a lot of us out there where you have little aches and pains you've accumulated over time, doing the exact same thing consistently uh, probably does not make the most amount of sense. Yeah, there's. You know, there was a point uh, about, there's a three year period where I was trying not to get surgery, but yeah. still pursue my bodybuilding and powerlifting goals. Yeah. And I found that I was able to maintain my strength in my squat and my deadlift uh, with kind of that minimalistic approach of working up the heavy singles. And then I got my volume through things that had maximal transference, yeah. but still caused me issues. So for example, I was doing box squats to as low as I could, but with the competition position on my back, so still low bar, I was doing... Uh, front squats to the depth I could. Yep. I was doing heavy walkouts, but I really could only actually do my competition back squat to depth one or two times every two weeks. Yeah. And then that would still cause problems. So I would basically three weeks out, squat yep. once a week, yep. and then go into competition. And I squatted uh, 222 and a half in my last comp in 2016. Yep. 2013, guess how much I squatted? 220. 22 and a half. Oh, 22 and a half, yeah. Two, 220, sorry, <laughs> sorry. 22 and a half. So, so basically I squatted uh, 491 and then I squatted 491 <laughs> three years later. Yeah. So I had successfully maintained all my strength at a reasonably high level for where I had started, um, but I had not made progress. Yeah. And that, at that point I was like, you know, I really need to get this done. Yeah. And you know, I haven't reached that peak again, but I have hit, you know, I think 16 weeks after, I mean, 24 weeks after surgery, I hit a, a 200 kilo or 440 high bar squat, yep. which is a lifetime PR. Uh, and that caused me a lot less stress being high bar, but it still caused some. Yeah. And at that point, that's when I went right. I'm going to train 90% for the goal of hypertrophy. Yes. Uh, and that is when we, I started to do that, that 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 next approach, where I was really using as primary movements hack squat, leg press, uh, safety bar squat. And I like that you could see the visual improvement because I think uh, humans are visual animals where they want to see that. So mm -hmm. we're talking about it. We're talking about these concepts, but the proof is in what you did. I think this is important for everyone out there that maybe uh, is also taking a look at the longevity of their training yeah. uh, where they're not just thinking, man, I'm good. Like it's time to go Larry wheels. I'm like, perhaps, or yeah. perhaps it's like, oh, where are you going to be in three years, five years, 10 years? How are you going to organize your training? Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, all you folks who are not yet 36, will one day be 36. And then after that, I've heard you only get older. <laughs> yeah. Again, so, proof's in the pudding, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Yeah. At that immortality serum might be there. Mm. Uh, coach, is there anything you wanna say in closing? I think in closing is just remember that the range of motion you choose, the exercise selection you choose, don't just do it because someone else has shown you it or because they've told you these movements are good or these movements are the best for X, Y, and Z body part. There's tons of human variation. Uh, your hip joints are going to be different than mine. Your knee joints can be different than mine. The range of motion you can achieve, uh, the amount of dorsiflexion you have, uh, your femur length, and where you've been in, in history, whether you've already been injured or not. So please, if your goal is to build a muscle group or build strength, realize you have a lot of options and don't be pigeonholed into thinking you must do the big three or X, Y, and Z exercise. No. Eric, fantastic stuff. Where can people find you? You can find me. <laughs> in St. Louis, rolling on down. I'm sorry. You can find me at 3dmusclejourney.com. That's yep. the number three, the letter D, musclejourney.com. The whole team, we have a lot of content about natural bodybuilding, powerlifting, uh, blogs, podcasts. Yep. You can also find me with you on Iron Culture if the you really want to dig in. And what's Iron Culture all about? Oh, I'd say it's about science, yep. uh, culture, yep. and history. Yep, that would be an accurate assessment. We have uh, some fantastic episodes, uh, one all about periodization. This is, people have been asking for me to get a little bit more complex. Well, thanks to someone with, I don't know, a PhD, uh, doing two hour interviews about auto-regulation, periodization, talking about the ketogenic diet, talking about carbohydrates. Um, we had a, a hypertrophy round table. We have a strength and hypertrophy round table. We talked about disordered eating, really, really in-depth stuff. So I'd highly recommend checking that out. And lastly, if you want to see some dancing, and some posing, make sure to check out Eric's Instagram, Helms3DMJ, which is also linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like the damn video, and I'll see all you guys, my rascals, in that next one. Peace. Eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your fucking vegetables.